All right, we'll get started with the esports and online gaming session. Uh, this is the keynote. Uh, and today the keynote will be given by uh, Dr. Selen Turkai, um, who's a senior lecturer in computer human interaction at the Queensland University of Technology. And she has prepared a, a really nice presentation for the special track in esports and online games. And um, I'm happy to give the floor to you, Selen. I'm looking forward to your presentation. I've, I've admired your work for, for many years, I've cited it also many times. And, and looking forward to, to really see um, your talk today. Thank you, Casper. Let me go ahead and share my screen. So you guys can confirm with me that you can see my screen. And if at any point that you cannot see my screen or you cannot hear me, um, let me know. Yeah, we can see your screen. All right. Excellent. Well, I'll go ahead and start then. <laughs> so hello, everyone. Uh, as Casper said, my name is Salan Turkai, and it is very nice to be with you online from down under Brisbane, Australia. Uh, today, I'll be speaking about my research on online gaming communities. So I am a senior lecturer in the School of Computer Science at Queensland University of Technology. In the last four years or so, I have been exploring experiences of esports players and esports communities. And in these studies, um, I have been using mixed methods with leaning a bit more heavily on the qualitative methods like interviews and focus groups to have an in depth understanding of player motivations, experiences, as well as well being outcomes that I'll speak a little bit today. So, in the next hours, and in the next hour or so, I'll present some evidence on the good of the online gaming communities, uh, building on some of the theories that can help us understand people's motivations to play and different experiences that they may have. Then um, we'll take a quick peek at some of the bads that I have found in my research and we'll move towards the existing problems, specifically the uh, toxicity, which is basically the epidemic of online gaming, especially when it comes to esports. And finally, I will conclude my talk with some remarks on uh, what can be done against toxicity. So I guess I cannot see, I had, I was going to ask like how many of you play multiplayer games, how many of you play esports and how many of you are familiar, but um, I can't actually see the text or anything on my screen. So um, let me see if I can bring the chat and you guys can tell me um if you want to... can people uh type perhaps on the chat uh whether you play multiplayer games yeses noes yes no <laughs> okay perfect perfect so how many of you are familiar with esports Cool. Excellent. So I don't need to explain what esports are. <laughs> so I'll move forward. So the good and the bad. Well, as you may know, playing video games is among the most popular leisure activities out there with an estimated 3 billion players worldwide. According to the 2021 ESA report, 77% of players play with others which was an increase from 65% in 2020, which is basically, you know, every year more people are playing uh, social games, online games. Why is that? So one of the reasons for this increasing engagement is online multiplayer games provide essential opportunities for individuals to satisfy their fundamental needs for autonomy, competence, and relatedness. This is through various social affordances these games have. So you may ask, well, what is social affordance? So social affordance is uh, the relationship between the properties of an object, and in our case, uh, a video game, and the social characteristics of a given group, which enable this particular uh, group to interact with um, among the members through those affordances, uh, through the features. 
So this means that uh, different types of groups can interact with the properties of a video game in different ways. So as you can see here on the top of the uh, text, people are trying to um, coordinate and um, have fun, but at the bottom text, they are basically fighting and being nasty to each other. So this is, this is one example. So in online games, uh, those social affor affordances, uh, such as using text and voice chat, you know, group finders and collaborative game mechanics, they have tremendous effects on players' social experiences. And these different types of social experiences lead to the emergence of friendships and online communities. It is basically one way for people to satisfy their need for connections with others and uh, have that sense of belongingness to fight perhaps against the loneliness. So another important mechanism that can impact well-being outcomes of engagement with video games is passion. So passion is a strong inclination towards activities in which people find value and enjoyment, and as a result, are willing to invest in time, invest time and effort. So satisfaction of people's basic psychological needs, those autonomy, competence, and relatedness, this can lead people to develop a passion uh, for, for an activity. And in this case, if they satisfy their uh, needs in the video game towards video games. And passion can be harmonious um, and it can be engaged willingly in balance with other activities, or it can be obsessive. And if it is obsessive, an individual displays more rigid and uncontrollable urges to engage with the activity. It was found that the harmonious passion for gaming is associated with uh, a lot of positive outcomes, including uh, life satisfaction, as well as social capital, which is relevant to us. So as an example, in one study, uh, Perry and colleagues found harmonious passion to mediate the positive association between playing with others and social capital in a multiplayer game. So they also showed that playing with online and physical friends strengthen the relationships, which is about the bonding, whereas playing with online friends and strangers help form relationship, which is, uh, which is about the bridging aspect of the social capital. So a uh, different locus of where the relationship starts help them um, um, satisfy different types of uh, social capitals or build them, help them build different types of social capital. So another study uh, with World of Warcraft players found that harmonious passion for the game increases well-being by building social capital again, and mostly through bonding, the strengthening the relationships and reducing loneliness. So the process of bridging and bonding might help satisfy people's need for social connections, lead to the sense of virtual community. And sense of virtual community is very important. That is basically the spirit of belonging together. So having relationships in games and having that sense of virtual community uh, matters in several levels. And one of them is you know, the psychological, the other is even for performance. Studies found that players with stronger connections in games also have higher performance. Basically, they win more games. Also, it is common for players to transition from in-game only friends to real friends or continue their friendships in other games. So they kind of migrate together to different games. So they keep their uh, connections and that virtual community that uh, they created in one game and take it to other game and continue there. Yep. So when people's need satisfaction is low, in other aspects of their lives, or if those needs are frustrated or taken away for some reason, uh, such as in the case of COVID-19 pandemic, different behaviors can emerge. So again, in, uh, for, for the ESA report, um, according to the ESA report, people played uh, more hours of games and they played more, hour, more games overall during the pandemic uh, for various reasons, such as to deal with what they were going on and reduce their psychological stress. One of my PhD students, uh, Jessica, uh, she has been exploring the relationship between need satisfaction, passion, and well-being outcomes. And her first data collection was just before COVID-19 started in 2020. So she paused her data collection when the pandemic hit, 
because you know things were changing in the world, right? And then she restarted uh, the data collections after the onset of the pandemic around March, April 2020 or something like that. Uh, this allowed Jessica to compare how the relationships among those variables might have changed between pre and post COVID. So what she found is that um, the majority of the differences were about the influence of video game passion on well-being. So prior to COVID-19, Harmony's passion for video games was more likely to be associated with a reduced likelihood of problematic video game play, while obsessive passion had a greater likelihood of being associated with it. But when we look at the uh, during COVID-19, in addition to obsessive passion being associated with increased likelihood of problematic play, it also helped people reduce their psychological stress. So that was, um, that was a novel finding. In the context of a stressful and difficult life, um, life event, video game play appears to be more influential <laughs> in a person's life. People spend mo more time playing video games. Also, both obsessive and harmonious passion for video games was associated with positive well-being outcomes. In a separate study, uh, we explore the role of video games in people's lives during the first couple of months of COVID-19 isolations using in-depth interviews. Echoing the findings in the ESA report, the social video gaming was one of the lifelines for the majority of the participants we had. They got to keep their connections with their friends through gaming, and they replaced their social routines of going out and having a drink with their friends um, in games by playing and chatting. And many of, many of the participants remarked that online games being a good social outlet for them. So across those two studies, um, it became clear that video games might have provided people um, as a compensatory mechanism for coping with the stressors they experienced during a stressful life event such as COVID-19. So that is a good thing. <laughs> the goods about games and online games specifically. In the uh, interview study, we also found that uh, participants noticed an increase in negative behaviors during their online interactions with strangers, primarily in competitive games. So they, they remarked that um, you know, a lot of new people were joining and um, they started typing really um, you know, negative comments and they experienced more toxicity in their uh, competitive game experiences. So for one participant, toxicity was the reason they did not, they did not play uh, multiplayer games during the pandemic. So what if strangers cannot text each other in a competitive online game, right? It turns out that, you know, our participants were, um, they were experiencing the toxic toxicity and that negative behaviors the most through text. So what if, you know, they cannot text each other, right? Uh, do we get less toxicity? Good question. <laughs> so in one study, we chose um, this online collectible card game called Hearthstone. Uh, it is, it's a game where the communication is limited. Text chat is disabled except between online friends. And the only communication during play can be done using preset emotes. Right? So we investigated how players experience um, their community differently in this, in this uh, online collectible card game, Hearthstone. So this was the research question. This was a part of a larger study. And we asked, what are the players' attitudes towards and experiences with the Hearthstone community. So we had we were, we were running an online survey, and this was part of um, part of the survey study. And we did not prime participants to focus on in-game or out of the game social experiences. Instead, we, we were interested in uh, learning about what comes to their mind when they are thinking about the games community. So we wanted to tease that out. Do they think more about um, you know people they play with in the game? or people they uh, converse in forums and outside of the game or Discord, et cetera. 
So uh, we did a thematic analysis of those responses and uh, 344 participants out of uh, 502 uh, responded this open response question. And what we found is that about 45% of the participants were really positive about their experiences um, with the community. And they talked about the helpful and intellectual characteristics of the players as reasons they compared the Hearthstone community to the communities of other games. They found Hearthstone players more mature. And they also think that one-on-one, uh, one-to-one -on -one, one -one game mechanic, uh, you know, not needing to deal with a team and restricted chat uh, made the game less conducive to toxicity. But they also <laughs> remarked, some of them remarked that even though you cannot chat with strangers in the game, you can see hundreds of aggressive behaviors in various online groups and forums. Yeah. So <laughs> in addition to 45% of positive attitudes, 34% of the players did have uh, negative attitudes. They also talked about the toxicity and negativity in the community, both, both in-game and out of the game. And some of the reasons they get for these feelings were intolerance towards certain play style. So, um, you know, one of them were saying, you know, everyone likes the class, but some, you know, some exaggerated, really treat other players who play other type of decks as stupid, right? And the other reason was that, um, you know, the beha negative behaviors towards women. And we also looked at some of the specific behaviors they talked about um, when they are, um, they are bringing up this uh, negative experience, right? What were the other things um, they, they, they experienced? And one of them was about emote spamming, which is uh, about clicking on emotes repeatedly during the game to annoy other player. Now remember, it was um, just preset emotes. I don't remember how many at this stage but they could choose like, let's say one of the five emotes to um, communicate with the other player and they keep spamming it to annoy the um, opponent. And um, the other one was that um, the friending to flame. So the friending to flame was an emergent behavior that we found in this study. It's about friending a player. I remember that I mentioned only uh, in-game friends can chat and have conversations with each other. So friending the flame is about friending a player with a sole purpose of uh, typing extremely offensive messages at them. So um, the person who gets the friending um, think that, oh, I have played so well that this opponent wants to be friends with me and learn from me, but all they want is to really uh, curse at them, right? And this behavior overall seemed really disruptive, uh, disruptive destructive <laughs> um, and many players commented that they do not accept friend request because of the uh, expectation of this behavior right so this was you know something really psychologically uh, terrifying for players to get uh, yelled at in the game so they they wouldn't accept uh, friend requests so this was the Hearthstone study. So where we are at is, you know, we talked a little bit about the good aspects, social connections, sense of virtual community. As we go through the ugly, keep those good things in mind, all right? <laughs> so we're getting to the ugly part. Um, in 2019, my team at QUT and I decided to conduct a study with esports players at, at the Queensland University of Technology to understand their social experiences, including team collaboration. It was about time that the, the QUT esports uh, arena, it was built in 2017, but it took a while to uh, basically build up. And um, around 2019, it was becoming really a popular place for students to hang out. And there were really big body of uh, esports players, but you know, semi-professional and a lot of our gaming students I teach in the gaming um, uh, BGIA, which is called Bachelors of Games and Interactive Environments. A lot of our students were part of that esports arena. So we wanted to understand how they're actually experiencing this 
uh, social environments, you know, uh, as, you know, team collaboration, how they collaborate in the game and how that, that might impact their experiences overall on campus and among each other, uh, you know, in the physical, you know, campus life and digital camp campus life. So had uh, big ambitions for the study. So what happened is that as we started the interviews with participants, what we found is that that the toxicity was one of the key experiences our participants had. So after the, um, I remember four or five interviews, we kind of changed the direction or um, to say added more specific questions to our interview protocol to ask about their experiences because that kept coming up in our initial interviews. Um, so again, we did not set out to study toxicity at all. It was an emerging thing that our, um, our participants brought up. That's the study that I will present was born. <laughs> so moving forward, what does toxicity mean to you? What comes to your mind when you hear about toxicity? So type it away. Harassment, yep. What else? Hmm. Seemingly common in first person shooter games, yeah. A common experience. All right. Anything else? Negative emotions, yeah. Bullying, no consideration towards teammates. Very good. Thanks, guys. <clears throat> Basically, um, it is it is all of those and more. <laughs> like so, it's like flaming, trolling, griefing, bullying, sexism, racism, and bad manners. Right. So, toxicity. Um, as a concept, you know, online toxicity. It has been an issue since the early days of the internet, but the term has become um, really not, I don't wanna say popular, but, you know, became part of the discourse of these online gaming communities in the last years, right? And kind of corresponds to the emergence of esports and esports communities. And um, again, it is not only the, Toxicity is not only the issue for online games. Uh, for instance, in 2018 Pew Research, 59% of US teens and 41% of US adults, they, um, they reported that they have experienced, that uh, they have been bullied and harassed online in their online interactions in social media. And that includes also <laughs> games as well. So it's not, on, it's not only the issue for online games. So um, who are those toxic people, right? Who, who are those people do flaming, trolling, all these terrible things? So what do you think? Who are these, who are these toxic people? Not us, we're nice people, never. What do you guys think? Young audience, mm. sore losers. <laughs> you guys, yes, this might be. All right, very good, very good. You already got some of those. So uh, there are some studies that found that looked at you know who are the um, who are those toxic people and ruin others' games and days. So one study using data from 2.5 million players, um, they found that those who play ranked matches exhibited more toxic behaviors compared to those who play normal matches, okay? Players who play ranked matches. Also, another study found that playing with friends was also predictive of toxicity. Um, so adding to what Pierre was saying, younger players were another group. It was found that they, they 
uh, show more toxic behaviors. One study showed that uh, younger Dota 2 players, they felt communication abuse. It's a blanket term, you know, encompassing all those forms of toxicity, including flaming and bigotry, is less serious or even normal, right? Those younger players. So we can predict that if you are playing with a young player in a ranked match, and if they are in your friends group, you know, they're more likely to show toxic behaviors than others. It's a prediction based on this um, prior research, right? So um, good guesses though. So what do you think the motivation behind these toxic behaviors? Why do some people behave so horribly? You know, what are their motivations? So Hassan said sore losers. Right, that might be one. What else? Why do they do that? What do you guys think? What do you guys think? Want to assert dominance by showing they are tougher. Mm. What do you mean engagement and immersion? It's an interesting one. They're too to the game to get noticed. Interesting, to release pressure and frustration. Good ones, very good, yeah. So in reality, we don't know a lot. We know very little, right? One reason uh, might be that online disinhibition effect. So the studies found that players in online games experience this high level of uh, disinhibition. Uh, it is a sense of unrestrained freedom because they think that they will not be judged or suffer from real world consequences, consequences of their actions due to anonymity. So it is the anonymity. Okay, that might be uh, one reason. And when we look at the online disinhibition, there's the benign disinhibition that allows us to share things right uh, in a positive way or neutral way. And it is the one that we were talking about is more toxic disinhibition. Okay, that might be one reason. Uh, the other is um, one study found um, that you know they investigated the motivations for trolling. It's perhaps one of the more interactive forms of toxicity. And they found that with the interviews with the self-admitted trolls, they found that the motivations fell into these three main categories, the attack, the sensation seeking, and interaction. And that, those basically cover some of the <laughs> reasons that you guys came up with. So the attack motivation is the most malicious one. This they, you know, if, if people want to attack other people as a motivation, they want to reduce other players' enjoyment of the game, right? And the other is sensation seeking. And these people seek entertainment from drama, right? So they 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 ruin other people's games and they um, drive enjoyment out of it. And lastly, uh, there were trolls motivated by interaction. And this was like, they felt the game had grown boring and they hoped that other players would join them in free form play rather than pursuing the stated goals of the game. So that is the interaction is the other motivation that uh, was found. So that was, that's pretty much all we knew about you know, the motivations of toxic players. So uh, the next question that I have is, why does it matter, right? Why does it matter if someone's toxic? What are the effects of toxicity? What do you think? A little more guessing game. Some people do not respond well to toxicity. Yeah, it's true. Any other guesses? This is a difficult one. <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay. Mental health of players. Absolutely. Very good one. So studies found uh, that toxic behaviors can cause detrimental effects to the players, right? As a consequence of being a victim, players may experience psychological and emotional problems such as anxiety and low self-esteem. And being exposed to toxic behaviors for a long time may cause 
victims to normalize such behavior and perhaps they can become perpetrators themselves, which adding to this vicious cycle of hostile behaviors in games. And victims of harassment may also be um, the discouraged from playing the game altogether, right? If, if someone is being exposed to harassment too many times and getting humiliated, they may quit the game. And they may even, um, you know, their, their relationship with games at large might be affected because of the experiences that they have had. Okay. So these are some of the effects of toxicity. Um, the other one is, you know, further effects of toxicity. If, if the players feel excluded socially, you know, what we were talking about, I was talking about earlier, you know, the, how social games help people to feel that um, social connection and um, help build sense of virtual community. But through this toxic behaviors and harassment and constant negativity, they can feel socially excluded. And rather than helping them satisfy those needs for social connection, it would frustrate them further, affecting their well being negatively. Okay. So that's why we do care about uh, toxicity. It, it can impact people's experiences with games, it can affect their mental health, and it can affect um, all sorts of other aspects of um, their experiences and may turn them into toxic individuals as well. So while looking at uh, the literature around, you know, what toxicity is, you know, who are the toxic players and um, you know, why do they do that? How does it impact? Uh, we found some gaps as well. So one of the things that we found was most of the prior studies used log data, uh, game log data and surveys to identify behavioral and psychological effects of toxic behavior or use chat logs to classify toxic conversations. So that was um, one aspect. So even though these studies provide uh, a lot of insights on player behaviors, it is quite difficult to understand why players may think particular actions are toxic or not toxic and how they experience them and how they may cope with them. So with with those gaps in mind, we came up with um, some of our research questions. And those were, um, you know, we wanted to find out how collegiate esport players defined toxic behaviors. What does it mean to them? You know, how do they perceive toxicity? And how do they experience toxic behaviors? And uh, finally, how do they cope with it? You know, you know, if there's a conflict, what do they do? We wanted to know all those aspects. So in, the, in this mixed method study, we interviewed 19 collegiate eSport players. Uh, we recruited them from uh, Queensland University of Technology's eSport arena. And we did two semi-structured interviews because I was also interested in how their experiences may change over time, right? And you know, we couldn't do too long because students may graduate or quit, who knows? So in over six months, um, we did two semi-structured interviews and we also did uh, short monthly check-in uh, surveys, asking them you know, whether uh, they, ha they have experienced any negative uh, behaviors, any toxicity in the last month. And you know, if they did, um, what did they do? So in the, um, in the semi-structured interviews, we asked participants to define toxicity, what it meant to them, and what actions they considered toxic. So we also posed follow-up questions to elicit further information. You know, you know, tell me more, can you give an example, stuff like that. So again, the questionnaire that we send them um, every month, it included uh, Likert scale questions, right? The one that, um, you know, have you encountered any, you know, how much toxicity you have encountered? It's like a while now, I forgot. Um, it's like not at all to uh, pretty much all the time, right? In your games, we ask like, none of my games had any toxicity uh, or rarely I had toxicity to all the time. 
Okay, I think I'll give an example later. <laughs> so, what did we find? What did we find? So, perception of toxicity uh, to understand, uh, we wanted to understand what did they perceive toxic, right? Um, participants' definitions ranged, for, ranged from uh, not taking the game seriously, so people who don't game, do not take the game seriously are toxic players, to discrimination, so you know, very low to um, very high in a way, and some define toxicity broadly, uh, capturing numerous negative behaviors like what we were saying, the like harassment, you know, being negative, etc. And other definitions highlighted more serious forms of negative behaviors, including racism and sexism. So at the end, uh, we found uh, three overarching teams. Uh, one of them was intention. The other uh, was unsporting behavior. And lastly, tilting, tilting. And I'll go over them one by one. So for intention. <laughs> Participants think that uh, for an action to be perceived as toxic, uh, they need to think that the inten intention um, had to be uh, had to be um, create to create a negative uh, behavior. Um, so intention needed to be communicated, right? So they define toxicity not by the specific actions of a player, but by how they perceive the intent behind behind those actions. So these intentional toxic actions are grouped into harassment and mistreatment of other players, such as bullying and belittling them, and intentional actions uh, which disrupt the game. Right? They they intentionally uh, went you know went under the turret and killed themselves. Right? They knew what they were doing, so therefore these players are toxic. And this was often contrasted contrasted. <laughs> anyway, I cannot say the word, apologies, uh, with memeing um, and joking around, right, which was not considered as toxic uh, to players because uh, to them, uh, memeing or uh, joking around was, uh, was not intention uh, to be toxic or negative. They were just joking around. So it, is not, it was not toxic. It was for humor, right? So the next one was unsporting behaviors. And these behaviors went against the idea of fair and respectful team play and conflicted um, with other players' expectations of teamwork and in turn ruined the game. So things that people would do to ruin the game was uh, toxic to players. And this kind of behavior was seen as not cooperating with the team, disrupting the team's communication and intentionally feeding uh, where a player would get themselves eliminated to disrupt the progression of the game, right? Intentional feeding. And other participants described toxic behaviors as abandoning the game, just quitting the game, and refusing to follow the game's objectives. So these were uh, some of the unsporting behaviors and players defined those as toxic. And as one player defined, um, described toxicity, to summarize you know, what he was thinking, it's almost anything that isn't communication, teamwork, trying to win, and trying your best. If a player doesn't do any of those, they are toxic players. So overall, the participants emphasized the impact of unsporting behavior on the game rather than on player themselves. So the final uh, major theme was uh, the concept of tilting. So this is a term borrowed from uh, poker. It is, um, participants describe this as a, a cyclical nature of negativity, which feeds into toxicity and ultimately ruins the game. So the tilting would often result from a bad game or a mistake. So players uh, play and they get unlucky and then they get frustrated, they join in another game and they lose another one and they keep doing the same thing again and again and they get really, really frustrated at the end and they turn into toxic players. So they, um, our participants talked about that, that tilting and this would lead to reduced team progression and therefore even more frustration. So this cycle would eventually lead to very, very toxic behaviors according to the participants. So the other question that we asked is how do players 
experience toxicity. toxicity. So as part of the monthly check-ins, as I mentioned, we had asked them to rate uh, toxic encounters from never to all the time. There you go. <laughs> so remember now. So uh, when we asked people um, that frequency, the overall the average across was around rarely. But when we're talking about their uh, experiences of toxicity in uh, in interviews, they were saying, "Oh, one out of three games." It's like it is, it is not quite the same. One out of three games versus rarely, right? One out of the three games is um, quite often uh, to me, at least. So this was uh, to me was one of the ways to um, normalize the toxic behaviors that they were encountering, right? So when we looked at their, um, uh, their narratives around how they experienced the toxicity, it, it grouped into you know, experiencing the toxicity at the community level, uh, which we uh, named it as like toxic others, and at a personal level, as we called toxic selves. So let's look at some of those who are those toxic others. So we found that players tend to enhance their perceptions of groups they belong to. So what they would say uh, when they talk about their games, how they experience the game, it was like, hey, you know, my, you know, I, we have very little toxicity in our game. It's just like those little group of participants, uh, little group of players um, who are the bad eggs, right? Not the majority. So it is in a way that uh, for, for players, it was divided into in-group, you know, my, my group, uh, my, uh, uh, my community in the game, and the others, which they would give examples like, no, I'm playing Dota 2 and my, uh, my community is fine, but those League of Legends players, they are the worst, right? It's like in-group and out-group. So they would talk about toxicity like that. And... <clears throat> To those players are the toxic players. So um, many of the participants overall, they perceived their game communities as welcoming and friendly and claimed, again, it was just a small minority of players who were toxic. toxic. And they would go ahead and say, like, um, toxicity, toxicity is not a problem for esports games at large, right? Because they wouldn't, um, uh, they wouldn't think it was a problem for their own games. But at the same time, majority of the participants recounted toxic elements of their online game, com game communities. So there was um, something going on there, right? And overall, what we found is that they had this um, fatalism about toxicity, declaring that it will always be there as a natural outcome of this anonymity that we talked earlier and competition. If there's competition, if there's anonymity, toxicity will be there and nothing can be done about it. So that is the overall, that was the overall um, perception and acceptance of um, their communities and um, the toxicity in the communities. So, but when we looked at it, analyzed it a bit more, <clears throat> we, we found that um, they would talk about a specific type of players uh, as toxic players, right? And one of those players, type of players were intolerant players. So they would talk about um, intolerant players as toxic players and toxic others in the community. So those participants talked about intolerance towards inexperienced players and towards those who do not conform to expected play styles. This was similar to our findings in um, Hearthstone game, Hearthstone study, where participants were talking about, oh, if they're not playing a type of deck, you know, others would humiliate them, similar thing. So participants recalled being bullied or, you know, witnessing bullying if, you know, similar things happened in, in the games, if they did not conform to expected play styles. And uh, they described existence of players in the community with large egos who think they have enough expertise uh, to judge other players as trash players and despise them. And they, you know, they would feel entitled to humiliate other players because of their lack of expertise, you know, those, and that would uh, create barriers for, you know, new players joining the game or players who left coming back, 
or who are trying to trying new strategies, right? Really uh, creating big barriers for them. So in line with the prior work around toxicity among ranked games, uh, our participants also talked about how the majority of people in lower ranks or you know, in, in normal games, not ranked games, being forgiving because they are all in, uh, a, in a little less skilled environment and learning together, therefore being more forgiving. So this is one type of uh, toxic others or intolerant players. And the other was uh, try hards. And this is, this is a term uh, still <laughs> under development. So it's, it's used by our participants uh, to mean that uh, you know, people who are, who are trying a bit too hard, you know, it's referring to a player who sacrifices basically all the entertainment, all the fun uh, for the sake of winning. They're too serious. They take the game too seriously and all they want is to win. They don't care about the camaraderie. They don't care about having fun or you know, other players' feelings at all. All they want to do is um, try very hard and win. And many participants talked about how competitiveness of games catalyzes toxicity in esports games because people do want to win. Yeah. So also, um, some participants noted that they believed uh, this could stem from, again, the competitive matches, increasing the pressure to win. Uh, so some of the participants were hesitant to put themselves in positions like playing uh, professionally where they may become a try hard and toxic players. Uh, a few participants brought that up. It's like, I want, to, I want to try higher ranks, but I'm also cautious that I don't want to take the game too seriously and um, lose the fun that I'm having with the game. So, and the other type of um, uh, toxic others were these uh, sexist players, right? So unfortunately we, do still find the presence and persistence of gender bias and sexism in esports in online games, really. And what we found was that regardless of what role women choose to play in their games, they are discriminated against. So if they would play a healer uh, in the game, other players would make fun of them if they knew uh, they were a woman, you know, because of the stereotypes, right? And if they played a damage dealer, um, they would be criticized even before the game started. It's like, oh, you're not going to be able to do, you know, what you're supposed to do because you're you're a chick, right? So, um, so those were the sexist players, and um, that that behavior really uh, impacted the the participants, women participants, experience in the games. So. Since someone had to be perpetrators in these toxic instances, we asked participants whether they were, you know, they would be toxic players sometimes, like whether, whether they would uh, behave negatively as well. So we found, we found that uh, some of the, again, taking this fatalistic perspective, one participant that said, yes, 100% they do <laughs> because they think everyone does it. Like, and uh, he continued really like, there's no way that you can always be positive. So for sure, um, he definitely do um, behave negatively and uh, be a toxic player sometimes. And uh, the other said, um, it, is, it is okay to be abusive as long as they make their team work together. So it is similar to what we were saying, you know, playing with friends maybe, so as long as they would make their team work together and they would win, um, for them, it was okay to be toxic and abusive towards their teams. And they also talked about uh, tilting sometimes, you know, making a mistake and um, continue playing and then mm -hmm. become frustrated with things and turn into a toxic player. So many of our participants themselves <laughs> were trolls, it turned out. But they did not think it was toxic because you know they didn't intend it to, right? To them, humor because it was humor aspect, it was not toxic. And supporting the prior work on the existence of toxic behaviors among players who were friends, we found that the idea of toxic uh, toxicity masquerading as humor 
uh, or it's used as tool to camaraderie, you know, it was okay for participants and they did not take, they, they did not think uh, that was toxic, uh, but we uh, categorize it as toxic others because even though they may not think um, because it's humor, it is toxic, other players may be still affected by, by uh, those behaviors. And finally, we wanted to know how participants dealt with conflicts and coped with toxicity in their games. So we found that all participants um, encounter, um, talked about different ways of uh, dealing with the toxicity and coping, you know, having different coping strategies when encou encountering toxicity in esports. And most of these strategies could be summarized as acceptance or avoidance, rationalizing and retreating from toxic behaviors. So let's take a look at them quickly. So most of our participants displayed some form of passively accepting or avoiding the toxic behaviors. Again, that fatalism aspect of it. It's like, you know, nothing can be done. Or they would say, um, yeah, it is, it is everywhere already. I'm not going to go and report the person just because they are toxic. And I have, the, I have, this, um, I have hardened throughout uh, my experiences in esports games over time, right? And others would um, discuss you know, avoiding confrontation with toxic players if at all possible. And they would only stand up for themselves as a last resort, if any. And especially if the game is ranked, they would stay silent because they would be afraid that if they say something, uh, they would frustrate other players, uh, the, the toxic player, and it would just go worse and they would lose the game and that would impact their ranks. So the other interesting behavior was rationalization. So we had seven participants described um, various ways of coming up with reasons, the rationalizing why that um, the toxic player is being toxic, right? So one was, um, you know, they described how they would give the uh, toxic player the benefit of the doubt. And it's like, okay, that person is probably having a bad day, right? That's why they're acting toxic. They're acting negatively. So one player said, okay, you know, I would, I would try to ask the person, like, are you okay? You know, is everything okay? And sometimes they would say, oh, yes, I'm, I'm not having a good day or, you know, I lost a couple of games or something like that, right? So that was one is the rationalization. And the other one was, um, one specific player, player 122, uh, he spoke very extensively about how um, his esports experiences have been mostly friendly and positive, and that the only toxic behavior he experienced had been toxicity from his friend. And his friend, when, when they were playing, they would call them, you're crap, get better, you're trash, you know, stuff like that, really, you know, abusive um, um, abusive way of helping them. <laughs> However, this, um, this participants saw these behaviors from their friend as coming from a place of caring, right? You know, my friend cared about my um, skills. You know, they wanted me to improve. That's why they were, um, they were so bad. And I know I'm bad. I know I'm bad. That's why my friend is trying to help me. So why, while they call their friend's behavior as toxic, they name them as toxic, they also perceive them as feedback and a, and a necessary mechanism to improve. It's an interesting one. So the, another, um, another way of rationalizing toxic behaviors. And um, the, other, uh, the other way of um, coping with toxicity was retreating. So for, for some uh, participants, if the situation become too toxic in the game, to continue playing or participating in the community, they choose to leave the game. So this ranged from some participants sim simply leaving the match. So they wouldn't be uh, matched with the uh, toxic players again, uh, which is also punishable behavior by game rules. A lot, of, um, a lot of companies, game companies punishes that in various ways, but you know, they cannot stand it, right? The toxicity, so they, they quit it, they quit the session. 
So sometimes they will switch to another game experience, often you know, play a single player game, just leave the situation, play another game. And to leave the game and its community for good due to the toxicity being unavoidable, they, they quit the game. And the other uh, category that we had, another theme, uh, we were looking at uh, coping as, an, as a women esport player. And uh, findings from our women participants support the prior work where women are constantly vigilant of their behaviors online, often muting themselves within games and using gen gender neutral names to hide their gender. We also found that um, women esports players moderate toxicity by proving themselves. Right. Uh, one of the participants would say, you know, I wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't talk, they wouldn't use the microphone until they prove themselves. They they really do really well in the game as a DPS. Then they talk and say, hey, you know, I'm actually a girl that plays DPS and I, I play better than you. So I proved myself. So I earn to be able to use the voice chat. So this was um, this was something that women players um recalled, uh, talked about their experiences in esports games. So we also um, we also found that how people, how players deal with their toxic selves, right? What do they do if they actually realize that they are behaving toxic? So. Um, one of our participants named this as like how to how to detiltify themselves, right? So how to detiltify? Uh, the first method was to switch to a more casual game. Um, so the casual mode, it would be um, not play ranked play, just play casual um, normal match or play another match with different people. Other participants gave example of less competitive games. Uh, they, they play to relax or unwind. And uh, that was one method. The other method was um, just stop playing for a while. Take a deep breath, you know, take a rest and just like take a break from the game. So those were uh, two main strategies uh, participants had. And uh, we also asked them uh, how they would uh, handle toxic situations within their teams or communities. So participants uh, spoke of two techniques. So some would use positive conversations to diffuse the situation and refocus players back to the game. So this would range from uh, you know, remaining positive when teammates are arguing to encourage them to keep trying and um, the match is still continuing. So be calm, it's not over yet, we are not losing, so keep going. You know, try to defuse this situation. The other was, uh, which was rare, uh, only four participants talked about it. They would stand up for others if they see that you know toxicity is happening among other players. If they are their friends, uh, they would stand up for them. Otherwise, they would they would ignore the situation. Uh, those were um, two main ways coping as a community. And finally, uh, we. We wanted to find out how many of the participants actually used tools that were uh, provided by the, the developers, right? Like reporting or flagging and stuff like that. So what we found is that only three out of nineteen participants uh, would use an active, would take an active approach and report toxic players. So most of the times you know, they continue, they would continue, it's like, okay, you know, nothing's happening, it's normal, it's, you know, taking this fatalistic perspective. And some discussed using mute function in the game, you know, just mute the parties, the, the player, and it's fine, right? And they didn't talk about um, reporting perpetrators at all. And one of, uh, some of the participants talked about, because developers have systems in place to deal with toxicity, you know, it was not a problem um, for them. Right, it, they don't have to. They don't have to deal with it. You know, there, there are systems there. You know, other players can report uh, the toxic players. Right, it's not their responsibility to do it. So, <clears throat> again, it's like they didn't take the active approach to report toxic players. 
So just to summarize uh, what, the, what I talked about in the bad section, right? Toxic behaviors are extremely common in esports communities. And um, you know, what people perceived as toxic were malignant, unsupportive behaviors and tilting. Those were main determinants of perceptions and um, um, the intention around it, right? And people who were perceived to be toxic were intolerant players, tryhards and sexist players. So those were toxic others, right? And toxic selves were uh, people who would uh, tilt and they can they would hide the toxicity behind, right? So, um, and the coping was um, around in this dictonomy of resilience or retreat, right? It is being resilient and um, um, actually doing something about it or retreating, quitting and uh, find rationalization. But overall, what we found is that uh, participants are highly likely to normalize toxicity and accept it as part of their experiences of esport because esports are competitive and because of the um, anonymity aspect of esports games. <clears throat> Lastly, as almost at the one hour mark, okay, next slide, please. <laughs> So what can we do about toxicity? So these are some of the ideas. Uh, I'm sure there are more. One is educating comprehensively. And this is about, you know, um, teaching people about different pers perspectives and experiences early, you know, through middle school or high school, after school programs or esports programs. It's possible to plant the seed of equity in esports communities and uh, acceptable behaviors and rules and regulations. The other is act responsibly. So it's about the, if you see something, say something. If you see something, uh, you know, act on it. So unfortunately there is this desensitization towards negative behaviors online based on what we found in our study. So many of the features being implemented by the developers like actively reporting or flagging, they are not used as much as they should be. And um, there's a lot of bystander effect going on uh, in, in our study, what we found. So participants would not do anything unless you know, the, the team, uh, the, the player that is being attacked is their friends. And the, uh, the third um, solution might be continue detecting automatically so machine learning has been used to successfully identify toxic behaviors, and it would be beneficial to see how these methods can be applied at large to benefit the gaming communities. So um, continue doing um, um, the filtering of the, the profanity and um, detecting behaviors that are perceived as toxic through machine learning. So creating positive role models. One of the things that we found that I didn't talk about is our participants talked about admiring professional players. And <clears throat> you know, they would say, hey, there's no, there's no toxicity in at the professional level. And when we brought out some examples, they would be like, oh, you know, that's that's normal though, because that kind of behavior also happens in normal, you know, sports, professional sports. But it is really important for professional esports players to act as role models to, um, to esports players, uh, the collegiate esports players. So there might be um, the way to the way to help with that is mandatory training to these uh, professional players on how to cope with negative emotions and toxicity and educate them about uh, sportsmanlike behaviors, such as sexual harassments, to prepare them as role models for other esports players. And finally is um, design ethically, right? As we know that games are not black, black boxes where we put players in and either good things or bad things happen. And you know, games are design systems. So while fixing player behaviors may not be a game industry professional's responsibility at large, designing more ethical systems is, is, um, is an important responsibility. So 
more can be done to investigate solutions um, through, through critical design and feminist HCI. This is um, a paper from Madden et al. from 2021. They talk about how to do that to, um, to create communities that are more friendly and equitable towards women esports players. So that is pretty much all I will talk today and I passed an hour. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to take questions. I'm going to go and stop sharing. Thank you, Son. That, that was a great presentation. Um, there is already one question by mm -hmm. Ilini, um, if I pronounced that name correctly, in the chat. Uh, and the question is, is toxic behavior more often in esports compared to other sports? You, you touched already a little bit on that, but... Um... Yeah, so other sports or, oh, or more reported is more, more often... Is toxic behavior more often esports or more reported here um, compared to other sports? Sports, uh, very good question. It is the answer I do not know. What we know is that there are a lot of examples of toxicity and negative behaviors in sports. However, what happens in esports is that um, some of the some of the motivations that we talked about, right, the anonymity being there and the, the, the competitive aspect that, um, that makes it easier for participants to um, show their aggressive behaviors. But I do not know any uh, comparison between sports versus esports and looking at the toxic behaviors, negative behaviors. Good question. Yeah, to, just to add to that, so I, I was just thinking about an example and this, this goes to, <laughs> sort of community man management and also about the normalization of toxicity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, of course, this is an anecdote, but it, it just goes to show uh, what the culture is and what, you know, what expected norms are. So, you know, I used to play soccer and there's a lot of profanity in soccer, of course. Um, and I once uh, somebody stepped on my toe while I was playing and, you know, I was started yelling at this person because, you know, obviously didn't want that to happen. And it immediately my coach exploded mm -hmm. and he did not explode towards the other player who stepped on my toe, but towards me because mm -hmm. he found it to be unacceptable that I was yelling at this other player and using all kind of profanities, you know? So um, this has to do with, you know, what, what is considered to be acceptable by the communities and by the people that are coaching and providing support to, mm -hmm. to, you know, esports players. Mm -hmm. I think is, is, is part of it, all of it. Absolutely. One of the things that we had, um, we were discussing within my team is that there used to be community managers in games even, and not anymore. So it is, um, at some point, League of Legends had the tribunal, right? It was kind of community management mm -hmm. through uh, participation and this democratization, and they took that away. And now it is all machine learning, but it's not helping as much, right? It's also not encouraging participation among uh, players to that, um, you know, detoxification <laughs> aspect of the community. So that's very true. Yeah. All right. I see Hassan, you have your, your hand up. So please ask your question. Thank you. First of all, thank you for a very interesting talk. It gave me a very different perspective of observing the games. So uh, my question is uh, that most of the data that you've collected is through interviews. So I'm curious how you choose the participants uh, who can participate in the interview and how do you frame your questions? And do you have certain criteria uh, according to which you select your interviewers or so on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good question. Yeah, so for doing the interviews for the the, the, um, the toxicity study that I talked about, the criteria was that um, they would define themselves as esports players. So we did not provide a definition, but again, we wanted to um, we wanted to understand what does it mean for them to be an esports player, right? So that was one definition. And the other one, uh, one criteria, the other one was uh, they were um, part of the 
university's esports arena. So there's a membership to arena. So they would go to the arena and play games there. So they would be part of that uh, gaming community. So we had some, um, some um, results around how they would perceive communities in person because they would play games um, in the arena versus online as well. But you know, in an hour, cannot pack too much. So um, um, what other criteria that we had uh, for that? Yeah, we try to recruit as many women as possible, but still the, uh, the percentage of participants who were members of the arena was really, really small. So we tried to convince as many as possible. So we were looking at the minorities and women as players, but those were basically much, pretty much all of it. So we weren't looking at um, professional players or semi-professional players at that time. So in 2019, the university had just started their uh, scholarship scheme. So if I were to do this study now, I would go and uh, recruit some of the semi-professional players we have now, we didn't have at that time part of the university. But yeah, good question. Thank you. Here. Hey, uh, thanks a lot for, for the great presentation. I thought it was very interesting. And also your slides are just really, really great. Like they are very visual. It's, it's really easy uh, to follow. Uh, I just had one quick question about uh, uh, toxicity and sanctions in game, like uh, if, mm -hmm. uh, for example, a player is banned for two weeks and then uh, he comes back, like, is there any change in terms of behavior? Does a player, you know, it showed the same level of toxicity after the ban, maybe less toxicity, mm -hmm. or like, has there been any, any study on that? Mm, that's a very good question. I feel like I just saw a paper on that. I need to look into it, but uh, it's a very good question. I do not know. It didn't come up in uh, my um, my interviews, but if anyone knows about it, Casper, uh, do you know anything about it? <laughs> if people are banned, no, I, uh, that, that's a really excellent question. I, yeah. I, I know that I, I looked at some communities and um, and they they do have temporary bans, but yeah. um, but I, I I do not recall uh, seeing what what happens after that with that mm. kind of behavior. Mm. Um, so that that would actually be very interesting research because there there are, there have been there are all kinds of communities where they in, indeed you know institute these temporary bans and you know uh, what what does happen you know there are people who continue to engage with toxic behavior and they get a permanent ban so like those are the kind of ways that some of the game communities are trying to manage so you know you get a warning. And then you know if you continue to engage in that behavior, you you end up getting a permanent ban. So that's how they hope to manage it. But mm -hmm. the question is, of course, you know how many of them actually end up getting a permanent ban? From what I saw with the data that I worked with, um, there weren't that many that got getting a permanent ban. So um, there were many more warnings than people were getting permanent bans. Um, but you know, um, there hasn't really been a good study, <clears throat> at least that I know of, um, that looked into that question. That would be really good to do. Yeah, yeah. So I was looking at, um, you know, if what has been done in the past year or two, actually for the preparation of this presentation. I feel like I have I saw something around uh, bands, but I need to look into that. <laughs> Thank you for <laughs> reminding me. Okay. I need to look into that. All right, thanks a lot. Uh, sorry, I, I couldn't answer your question. <laughs> Any other questions? <clears throat> There's a smaller question about availability to your slides. I know the recording will be made available oh, yeah. through the, the web, um, but if, if, if people want to have access to your slides. Yeah, sure, I can uh, make it into a pdf it's like it's currently like huge because they're all those images <laughs> but i can make it into a pdf and put it somewhere and share it i don't know what's the sharing no i'm happy for you guys to email me my email address is it where is it oh i'm not sharing my slides anymore i can put my email address here but yeah feel free to email me In the meantime, I, I have a question because you, you mentioned a few times 
Mm -hmm. um, the, the use of machine learning uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, that, that some of these communities do not have community managers anymore and that everything is managed by the AI. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so I just have a question to, to you, but also to, to the, the audience in general. You know, what, what role should AI have in, in managing these kind of communities? Because if we're, if we're basically delegating that completely to the AI and, and the way that the AI can play a role, it's not necessarily just looking at, at text. You can also look at gameplay activities, but you know, what role should AI play in managing mm -hmm. communities? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Um, to me, it is, it goes hand in hand, right? Involving the community and uh, using the advances in machine learning. So machine learning makes things easier for the community. It's like, it's not like every uh, flag that was raised could be brought to the community. It's like, is this, is this should be banned or is this, um, you know, is this toxic behavior? But once the, it's like a filter, right? Filtering through the uh, machine learning. And once it classifies as like, you know, I feel like, you know, the behaviors here are uh, definitely extreme toxic behaviors, right? They are their, their um, let's say, they're feeding to the enemy, right? They keep killing themselves. Okay, this I identified it and send it to this tribunal. It's like, is this really happening, right? So the involving the community somehow, it is some combination of machine learning and actual humans. Uh, that's my perspective. Yeah, <clears throat> so sort of uh, human in the loop. Yeah, system. human in the loop. Exactly. That's a good word. <laughs> mm. Yes. Uh, maybe some people in the audience have thoughts on, on what role AI should play. You can put it in the text or <clears throat> you can raise your hand and speak up. Um, just a comment uh, regarding human in the loop. Perhaps this is an important uh, thing because uh, self-learning algorithms eventually evolve into, they develop certain filtering policy that may add biases. Mm. And uh, those filterings may be appropriate for one user and for other person that may be a bias may not be toxic as much. So, you know, uh, there is a thin line and uh, reaching the equilibrium where everybody is satisfied and agrees to the policy that's uh, very hard to reach, especially in AI uh, when it comes to biases. Mm. Yeah, excellent point. Dealing with the bias in algorithms, right? It's a very important topic. What do we do about it? Anyone else? The role of machine learning in managing toxicity? Reducing, managing. If not, <clears throat> I have a, oh, a Hassan. Uh, yep, go ahead. Uh, sorry. You're no, no, please go. <laughs> uh, just curious, apart from machine learning, so there are games like a eight ball pool game, there's an app and uh, the chat option they have is uh, limited. There's a drop down chat and there are only a few options to quickly select from and to communicate mm -hmm. to their user. And these are very good options, like good luck, nice shot, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, in your study, did you come across any users who were using these limited options or mm -hmm. these games are not part of your study as mm -hmm. of now? Well, like the one that I talked about, the Hearthstone study, like online collectible uh, card game, it is basically what people do, the emotes and the limited chat. That's what they would use. Good luck, um, you know, um, good luck next time if they lose. But what, what we found is that a lot of people can also abuse those by emote spamming, right? If you click on that, like, you know, 25 times, it can still annoy the player. So they would, yeah, it is... It's, it was quite interesting. But yes, we looked at it and they, they thought that um, the Hearthstone where the, the text uh, chat is limited had much fewer uh, uh, opportunities for toxicity. 
And also it's not a team game, you know, fewer people are involved. So it is, it did, it did help um, to reduce the toxicity and opportunities for toxicity as well. So yeah, I'm sure it is the, yes, the, um, the limited chat is helping people to manage the toxicity. Thank you. So I have a, a, another question, uh, which may be uh, slightly difficult, uh, mm -hmm. but I'm just curious. So you, you showed um, the, the study that was happening prior to the pandemic then during mm -hmm. the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what, what will what will it all look like post COVID? And I know what is post COVID, you know, what does that even look like? But I'm, I'm just curious yeah. what people think or what you think. Uh, what gameplay behavior will look like, you know, now we're getting into this sort of post-COVID society. Hmm. That's a very good question. I have some ideas. I'll see if others have any ideas <laughs> first. Post-COVID. Is there even post-COVID? <laughs> just, just COVID. Well, I, I say this, and, and I'm actually, I tested positive in one day, so, um, so I'm experiencing it at the, at the moment. Mm. I'm, I'm isolated and on Zoom, mm. so don't worry. But yeah. Yep. So I can talk about like what we actually found in the um, in the interview study that I talked about, where uh, we interviewed people in the first couple of months of COVID. It was um, that started, let's say, March, April. The border of Australia closed um, late March. And we interviewed people around June. So it is like a little bit after the initial onset. And we asked people, you know, how, how did you deal with, um, how did you deal with the social isolations and just recall back. And the, the, the intensity of the, the COVID, it was not the same as um, Europe or, um, or America. So, but one of the things we found happened is that when people were uh, stuck inside the um, social isolations and restrictions happened, they played a lot of games and they thought that that's the only thing they can do. So there's nothing else to do but playing games. And we found that that actually uh, reduced their sense of enjoyment of the game because they thought that that was the only thing that I could do. They couldn't choose, right? One of the things that's good about games is that as a voluntary activity, I want to play a game because I enjoy playing the game. So, um, but then what we found is that after a couple of weeks, people talked about, they kind of, um, you know, thought about it and had that self-realization is that, what am I doing? It's like, I'm spending like 12 hours playing games. Right, so their hours reduced over time. So we found um, it kind of like stabilized over time. And I think there was uh, a study using um, I don't know millions of player data from Steam, and they found a similar thing. The first three four months of COVID nineteen, people played a lot, like you know doubled the the hours, but then it kind it dropped and stabilized after some point. So. So basically, some players, my, my prediction is that people who started playing games would continue playing games at a reduced level. And people who really uh, increased their players who were players to start with the COVID and increase their, of their amount of play, <laughs> they kind of stabilize over time and return to normal. That's my prediction. Yeah, I, I personally wonder if, if people engage with more more different kind, not just like in terms of the amount of play, but also mm. the kind of games they play or how much mm. they value social play, because, mm. you know, like uh, lots of people have engaged with playing board games online, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, sort of like very social activities, mm -hmm. but then online playing games and, and, and kind of interested to see how that, how that translates, yeah. um, you know. Board gaming in Boston, Casper, that you can join <laughs> yes. on the Discord. So we are still part of it, even though we are not in Boston anymore. 
So yep. yes, a lot of board gaming going on. And I started uh, being very much part of the online board gaming during COVID-19 pandemic. So yep. yeah, I do, I do prefer, I mean, even though it is, it is also competitive, it's not at the competitive level of, you know, um, um, League of Legends. It doesn't require me being uh, really efficient with my clicking or anything. <laughs> so yes, yep. yes, board games became uh, much more popular during COVID-19, it's true. Yep. All right. Um, not sure if there's a question from the audience, but otherwise I'll, I'll have one last question before we close this off. Sure. Um, so my last question pertains to, you know, when we're thinking about how do we address all the different um, issues that, that you've observed, um, how do you envision that the game industry and academia can, can work together to address this? Because like, obviously, you know, you're doing studies on entertainment games, you know, I've done that too, um, but how can, because this is a huge problem. I mean, we all recognize it um, and also the game companies themselves uh, recognize it as a problem. And, uh, you know, how can we work together? Like what would be an ideal model or what, how, how should that look like? Yeah, that's a very good question and a very, very difficult one, right? Because since I was a grad student, that's the same, the same thing. Like I, I used to study um, educational games, right? I was like, oh, how can we uh, collaborate with educational game companies and actually embed the you know, educational theories that we know it works into educational games? It never, you know, it never happens, even though we tried. So they have the different motivations of the academia versus industry that creates a conflict. My hidden agenda is that because I'm teaching in the games, um, games degree, educating students who will go into the game industry and <laughs> infiltrate game industry to change things from inside rather than try to collaborate with game industry because I don't see that's happening anytime soon, unfortunately. So that is my very pessimistic uh, answer. <laughs> Pessimistic, but it's still a strategy. So yeah, uh, yeah. always a strategy. <laughs> right. anyway. Well, thank you so much. Uh, if there's no remaining thank questions, then I think we can uh, close off the session. It was really incredible to see your work. I, I enjoyed it very much. Um, well, thanks for thank reminding me, Casper. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm gonna. Yeah. <laughs> and thank you all for for being here. Um, and uh, there's gonna be two more sessions. Uh, one is in, in two hours, um, and then the other one uh, follows after that uh, for, for the special track of uh, esports and online games. So thank you for attending.